If you committed a horrible sin in life, but still had a life to live, what would you do? Would you accept that you're a terrible person and just wait to die off? Would you work to try to redeem yourself? Or would you accept that you're irredeemable, but still work to correct the wrongs you've committed in life regardless? This is the dilemma of Huang Zhang Yap, one of the big architects of North Korea's philosophical ideology, who later defected to South Korea. He left behind not only his family, but the people who now lived under a dictator supported by his own writings. Regardless, his story represents philosophy being used in morally questionable ways. Like most forgotten philosophers not writing in English, it is extremely difficult to find accessible pieces to read. Thankfully, after defecting, Huang Zhang Yap contributed to an online newspaper called the Daily NK, a South Korean paper written by many North Korean defectors that reported on what was going on on the other side. Here, Huang Zhang Yap wrote and published his memoirs, which we'll be using to construct a picture of his life. Huang was born on January 23, 1923, in the South Pyongan province. He was a pretty calm but non-confrontational kid. While his brother got into lots of fights, Huang saw the effect this all had on his mom and vowed to never get into a fight. He grew up on a farm, so he had to juggle both the hard mental exhaustion of school life and the hard physical farm life. But unfortunately, Huang was one of those guys who got sick very easily, so he would often fall ill and miss school, making his report cards not that great. And during time in school, he honestly wasn't that interested in the normal lectures, kind of like how you have to take those required classes in high school and college that you really could not care less about. But he would sneak off to other classes to listen to lectures on things that actually interested him more, like philosophy. He went to college in Japan, and in college he could finally pursue philosophy seriously, reading a lot of German philosophy like Kant. Now during this time in Korean history, Korea was under the colonial rule of Japan. One night, while he was actually in Japan, a detective came, detained him, and he and some others were deported back to Korea. I had not felt that much racism towards us back in Japan, but as soon as we arrived in Korea, the fact that it was a Japanese colony could be felt strongly. He then was essentially forced to join the Japanese army, but because he really wasn't much of a fighter, he got drafted into becoming a laborer, and he continued to be a cement plant worker until Korea finally gained its independence in 1945. After independence, there were murmurings about communism and left-wing politics throughout Pyongyang, where Huang was at. Huang was working as a teacher at the time and started learning more about communism himself. He read Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and during this time he would sleep very little and only eat uncooked rice, which eventually resulted in dysentery. This man studied so hard that he got sick. Eventually, he was part of a group of students who went all the way to Moscow University to study Russian, dialectical and historical materialism, and more philosophy. Apparently he had this Russian teacher who fell in love with him, and after confessing her love, Huang replied, I do love you, but it is not love between a man and a woman. My love is more like sincere respect towards you. I hope you understand me. Let's still be friends. That is some next level rejection and friend zoning right there. He had many romantic experiences in Russia, but eventually met his future wife, Park Seung Ok. When he returned to Korea, he had become a master at Marxist theory and became program chair of philosophy at Kim Il-sung University. After that, he got another promotion as ideological secretary for the party central committee. He got to interact heavily with Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea, and Ghost wrote many speeches for him. With more promotions and his position growing higher, Huang was able to influence not only the ideology of Kim Il-sung, but of North Korea altogether. In these high-ranking positions, Huang was one of the big contributors to an ideology known as Jucha, which was essentially North Korea's form of Marxism-Leninism. Now Jucha is a whole can of worms in itself, but I want to highlight one part of it known as the 10 principles for the establishment of a monolithic ideological system. Huang apparently worked with Kim Jong-il on this, and these 10 principles can clearly be seen implemented even today in North Korea. They're very repetitive, but have a general theme that can be illustrated by the following examples. We must honor the great leader comrade Kim Il-sung with all our loyalty. We must make absolute the authority of the great leader comrade Kim Il-sung. We must make the great leader comrade Kim Il-sung's revolutionary ideology our faith, and make his instructions our creed. We must adhere strictly to the principle of unconditional obedience in carrying out the great leader Kim Il-sung's instructions. Every single one of these principles honors Kim Il-sung 
creating a cult of personality. And this continued on for Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un. Now this is where things become gray, both morally and historically. I don't know if there's an objective measurement we could use to determine how influential Huang was to the cult of personality ideology we see today in North Korea. But regardless of the amount of influence he did have, he did influence it nonetheless. This was the great crime that Huang would look back on in disgust. But how did someone so high-ranked and influential end up defecting to South Korea? Well, the first problem was writing a thesis that a certain special someone disagreed with, Kim Young-ju, the brother of Kim Il-sung. And family is gonna take precedent over high-ranking officials. This disagreement led to many firings, but what's even worse than a theoretical disagreement is a practical disagreement. Not even Huang himself, but Huang's father-in-law tried to escape North Korea to China. Simply by being related, Huang's wife got fired from her position. I was dissatisfied with the way communists have a strong, family-oriented spirit and think in prehistoric ways, but I didn't have any other choice but to accept my destiny. I knew that my anger couldn't change anything and that it would only advance my misfortune. These two events would haunt Huang's position in the party. Whenever there were conferences, he was heavily criticized and was even hated by the students he taught. Now, unfortunately, there's a big gap in the memoirs between here and when he actually decided to defect, at least from what I could access from the Wayback Machine. But the intro to the memoirs gives us some insight into the change in ideological mindset that must have taken hold of him. I lived in a society full of fallacy and deception for a long time. At first, I believed that both fallacy and deception were necessary for the liberation of the masses and the working people. However, I realized later on that they have more to do with the ego of the dictator. He laments that he was at the center of this ruling system in North Korea, and he would hype up and empower the dictator in charge. He comes to terms with the fact that he committed a great sin. What tormented me the most during my service to the North Korean regime was my own awareness of being used for fallacy and deception. Huang was able to defect by posing as a South Korean diplomat at a South Korean embassy in Beijing. Now, you'd think that China and North Korea being more buddy-buddy than with South Korea, that they'd turn him over. But maybe it's an international law thing that I don't know about, but China allowed Huang to eventually leave for South Korea. Now, here's the sad part. Huang never told his family about his plans to defect. After all, they were pretty loyal to the party, or at least pretended to be, so there was a chance that they could report him. So when he was on the plane leaving for South Korea, he thought about his family and all the people he was leaving behind. This is the way I chose, sacrificing my family and comrades. Is this the right way? Will I achieve enough to compensate for this huge sacrifice? But here's the thing, Huang was well aware that they highly valued family in North Korea, and knew that his wife and kids would probably be punished in some way. In fact, in his last will and testament, he writes to her knowing that she and his children will probably be killed. The fact that you and my loving children will all die in a cruel persecution just because of me makes me painfully aware of how serious my sins are. I have betrayed the love of my adorable children, grandchildren, and you. I am not asking you for forgiveness. I hope you will curse me most severely and cruelly. Unfortunately, Huang's wife would end up committing suicide. One of his daughters died under mysterious circumstances, and his other children and grandchildren were thought to be sent to a labor camp. Although a lot of Huang's works are inaccessible, an article written in the Daily NK by Mak Young-jae went over the 20 books Huang wrote after defecting, and it seems like a lot of his work criticized and spoke out against the North Korean regime. This makes me wonder if he considered going down this path of critique when he defected. Was he knowingly sacrificing his family in hopes that he would somehow bring about great change in North Korea to bring down the regime and save all those citizens? Was there some sort of utilitarian weighing of lives? Well, we know that he didn't see that change in his lifetime. Although assassins were apprehended trying to take his life, ultimately, it was a heart attack that did it in 2010. Huang jong yops life conjures up many different moral questions for us. Was his sin of committing his family to punishment really worth the potential to change the regime in North Korea? Did he honestly think he was going to change the regime or even make a difference after defecting? He's only one person after all. Maybe he was worried about making North Korea worse if he stayed behind. I'd like to kick it to you guys and hear your thoughts on this guy's life. If you were in his position, would you defect? What would you do with your life if you did defect? Anyway, that's going to do it for this video. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell button for more of these Forgotten Philosopher videos. And with that, I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.